This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. Well, it would be rash to attempt to forecast how the world will look even a hundred years from now. But it may be useful to jump that hundred years and from the vantage point look backwards. And in doing so, I shall assume, I hope correctly, that humans will have faced up to and coped with at least some of the problems I've discussed. The Anthropocene epoch should certainly continue. As in the past, there will be failures and collapses. So what is my guess for what the world will look like? Well, first, humans are likely to be living in a more globalized world of rapid communication. Here is an obvious consequence of current technology. Ideas and units of information, or memes, will pass almost instantaneously between countries, communities, and individuals. The wiring of the planet with fiber optics, cellular wireless, satellites, and digital television is already transforming human relationships. More than ever in the past, there would be something like a single human society and civilization. Already is something that is quite amusing to notice, but we're all wearing the same clothes. Whether they be suits or jeans, the whole world is wearing suits and jeans. Go back a hundred years and we were wearing something more interesting and very different in different parts of the world. In many ways, we're like ants. We, we can be regarded as a kind of superorganism. But also like ants, there will be fierce competition between groups and communities and more than ever anxious to maintain and express their identity. This new valuation of local or national identity is also something unexpected. We have a movement for Scottish independence from the rest of the United Kingdom. And there is a comparable movement in Catalonia in Spain to establish Catalonia as an independent state from the rest of Spain. Another product, <laughs> another product of local feeling is the widespread movements of intermittent protest against existing elites of whatever kind. This sort of protest can be seen in new shareholder mobilization against corporate management, worldwide discontent with autocratic regimes, particularly in the Middle East, and demonstrated there very clearly in the last little while. And here, new technology is crucial. The effects of increasing distribution of mobile telephones, as I've said, are enormous and they've yet ready to be fully understood. Well, human numbers in cities and elsewhere are at present rising fast, but it's hard to believe that this can or will continue in the second half of this century. By 2113, remember I'm still looking back from 100 years, in 2113, our numbers will almost certainly be substantially less. There are signs of this happening already. Some people will live longer, bringing its own train of problems, including, for example, employment. Their distribution will be different. Women will have a more important role. In many parts of the world, they are already achieving their long-deserved equality with men. And this will have enormous effects on the management of society. It has been suggested that an optimum population for the Earth in terms of its resources would be nearer to 2.5 billion rather than, as now, 7 billion or even 9 billion by mid-century. Next, communities are likely to be more dispersed without the daily tides of people flowing in and out of cities for work. Current obsessions with so-called growth and ever-increasing consumption will be replaced by the need to make better use of resources, respect the natural capital of the earth, a very important concept, and measure health, wealth, and welfare in a more rational way. We've been talking a little bit about this in the last few days. Application of new digitized technologies is already changing the character of manufacturing. Agriculture will be more local and specialized with greater reliance on hydroponics. Energy and transport systems will be, in my view, decentralized. Archaeologists of the future may even wonder what all those roads were possibly for. <laughs> on the one hand, some humans may thereby be liberated from many current drudgeries. Houses may be able to clean themselves, Robots will produce meals on demand, cars may drive under remote instruction, and evolution of desirable characteristics could even be automated. 
All, of, all this seems hardly imaginable when so many, so many, still have to trudge miles to collect fuel, wood, and water. On the other hand, humans could well become dangerously vulnerable to technological breakdown and thereby lose an essential measure of self-sufficiency. Fewer people will produce more and the character of employment will change radically. And all this raises questions about evolution. Changes are already taking place in the human organism, for example, in resistance or lack of it to certain diseases. Bacteria may have been defeated in many cases by antibiotics in the last few years, but they now seem, seem following a good Darwinian prescription, to be adapting themselves for a strong fight back. As Lord Rees observed in a science magazine of 8 March, synthetic biology offers huge potential for medicine and agriculture, but in the sci-fi scenario where new organisms can be routinely created, the ecology and even our own species might, long, might not long survive unscathed. Now these problems may seem a long way away, and let us hope without, without total confidence that by 2113, humans will have worked out and will practice an ethical system in which the natural world has value not only for human welfare, but also for and in itself. The human, super, the human superorganism must take its place along other superorganisms. Well, the penalties for failure to respect the natural world are enormous. Plants may not have brains, but they have an amazing sensitivity to the behavior of other organisms, well explored in a recent book, which many of you may have seen, entitled What a Plant Knows. They may even be able to communicate with bees, as would-be pollinators, by electric signaling. We tamper with the long and inf infinitely complex chains of mutual dependence at our peril. Extinction is as frequent as adaptation. Survivors in their original form over hundreds of millions of years are extremely rare. While humans may be no exception, I sometimes wonder how long it would last and take for the Earth to recover from the human impact. Future visitors from outer space, say thousands of years, not hundreds of years, but thousands of years from now, might well be puzzled by the fossil remains of ourselves and the agglomerations we call cities. In short, the relics of the Anthropocene. They might also wonder at the fossils of the other animals and plants we have so abruptly adapted for our own purposes. In the future, rats could be as big as dogs, water hyacinths could block lakes, and microorganisms could go macro. But they should know, as should we, that life itself, from the bottom of the seas to the top of the atmosphere, is so robust that the dominance of any one species could be no more than a relatively short episode in the history of life on Earth. Above all, we must recognize how small and vulnerable we are as members of a particular species in a particular environment at a particular moment in time. Let us, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy it as best we can for as long as we can. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.